in Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 8. This is the word of God. The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel. And all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. But the Lord raises the adversaries of reason against him and stirs up his enemies, the Syrians on the east and the Philistines on the west, devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. The people did not turn to him who struck them, nor inquire of the Lord of hosts, So the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed in one day. The elder and honored man is the head, and the prophet who teaches lies is the tail. For those who guide this people have been leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are swallowed up. Therefore the Lord does not rejoice over their young men, and has no compassion on their fatherless and widows, For everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns like a fire, it consumes briars and thorns, it kindles the thickets of the forest, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. They slice meat on the right, but are still hungry, and they devour on the left, but are not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm." Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together they are against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people to their right that widows may be their spoil, and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of judgment in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. Father, we need you to speak to us through your word. We need you to write this word on our hearts. Help us to see how these words are words about us and words that call us to repent and to seek your mercy. Speak to us now, Father. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's a difficult passage, but I think we'll find is is the case with God's word that there's treasure in every line. It's a song, really. Sometimes a songwriter will write a very shocking repeated refrain in order to grab people's attention and make the song stick in the minds of the listener and maybe make them wonder what that's really all about. Some songs have very difficult refrains to hear. Back in 1994, Beck had a hit song with a very disturbing refrain, because I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill me? Lovely. Some 21 years later, in 2015, Justin Bieber had a hit song with a refrain that has one of the catchiest roasts in pop music, You Should Go and Love Yourself. 
Now, I do apologize if I got either one of those songs stuck in your head this morning. They were stuck in my head as I was writing the sermon. So, <laughs> but why, what's my point there? Well, I think we miss out on the fact that if you're in the prophets or in the Psalms and you're looking at a prophetic oracle that's written out like poetry, like this one is, it was probably originally sung. And this one has a fourfold refrain. And so um, it, that's the chorus of the song, really. It's got four verses, and it's got a, a, a chorus, a refrain that comes back. And it's pretty chilling. It's pretty hard to hear. It would be hard to hear for the original audience, and I want it to be hard for us to hear this morning. This is one of those sermons that, you know, church growth experts will tell you not to preach. Skip this passage because people don't want to hear this stuff. But it's what God says to us this morning, and we need to hear it. The refrain four times is, For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For all this his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For all this his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. For all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. And each one of the four verses have the reasons why it is that despite prophets prophesying and people pleading and the Lord inflicting discipline and judgment, why it is that the people are continuing in sin and God is still continuing to be angry with them. The people's sin is terrible. Their consequences already had been sad and tragic, but the stubbornness of their hearts refuses to bend before God's discipline, and so God's anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Now, to understand the point of this song, we need to note something in the background here. Isaiah was called as a prophet to prophesy to Jerusalem and Judah. That's the southern kingdom after the split. And yet this song is about the northern kingdom. It's a word against Jacob. That's one of the ways of referring to the northern kingdom. Israel, Ephraim, Samaria, those four words that you see in 8 and 9, those are all ways of referring to the northern kingdom, Israel, its largest tribe, Ephraim, and its capital city, Samaria. So why would Isaiah be ministering to the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem and be singing about the northern kingdom of Israel and its capital Ephraim. Why do that? Is it helpful to, for people to focus on other people's sins? Not really. The reason why he's doing it, very simply, is that he wants Judah and Jerusalem to see the sin of their big sister Israel and to understand that the wrath of God that is coming on Israel is wrath that Judah and Jerusalem will also experience if they do not repent. In life, it is so much better to learn from the mistakes of others than to insist that we must make our own identical errors and see if the same consequences happen to us. And parents will know a lot about this. They'll say, trust me, I've done this before. It doesn't work out well. Make a different choice. And sometimes our kids are like, well, I'm going to have to see if it'll be different for me. And so it's almost like God is saying to Judah and Jerusalem, okay, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. And if you want to know what the hard way looks like, just look north and see what's happening to Israel. That's what the hard way looks like. And a little background as to what that meant. In, in 733 BC, Assyria, the Assyrian kingdom that uh, was north of, of Syria and Israel, it swept down and it swept along the west coast of Israel, and then it turned and it swept up along the Jordan River and through that valley. And so it sort of carved out the edges of Israel and devastated that whole area. 
leaving really only the central tribe of Ephraim, which was the largest tribe, intact. And so there's reference in here about how the Syrians on the east and the Philistines on the west devour Israel with an open mouth. You see that in verse 12. And that's because this path of destruction that the Assyrians had left behind. The Assyrians were not really a people that were interested in conquering, necessarily. They, they, they preferred to raid and to plunder and to take. And so they sort of carved this path, and then the Philistines from the west were able to sort of come in and have easy pickings because of the leftovers of the Assyrians and the devastated cities with all their torn down walls. And then the Syrians, not the Assyrians, but the Syrians coming from the other side. And so this is, this is the reality of the situation. Now, historically, what we know is that Israel doesn't listen. And so in 722 BC, 11 years later, Assyria comes in and just finishes them off entirely. So this is written, this song is written during this 11 year period of time when there's been great devastation and yet the people are being given an opportunity to repent. But we're told that they're not repenting and they're not going to repent and so they're gonna suffer that final defeat. And really it's Judah who's supposed to watch all of this unfold and who's supposed to learn their lesson. But they're slow to learn. Verse 10 says, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. These are words of pride and arrogance, verse 9 tells us. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You ain't never going to keep me down. That's, I mean, that's what our culture does so well, right? Our culture loves to boast in how we are going to overcome. We can do it. Sometimes, though, when God brings devastation into your life, what you need to do is not just dust yourself off and get up and say, I'm going to be better than ever. But you need to stop and say, what am I supposed to learn from this? How did I get here in the first place? What is God teaching me? How can I seek him? How can I humble my heart and seek him in this? That's exactly what they were not doing. When, when I read in here about how they were boasting of building back with dressed stones, it reminds me of the trip to Israel that we made about five years ago. And uh, when you go to Jerusalem and, and, and Judea area, you'll see still today these massive stones that have a very uh, neat border all around the edge. They're huge dressed stones. They've got a, a, a border that's carved into the edge of them. And archeologists know that those stones come from the building days of Herod the Great, who was the king in Jerusalem under the Roman occupation. But he was king in Jerusalem when Jesus was born. He's that King Herod. And the Jewish people, after suffering centuries of humiliation and devastation, and if you read uh, uh, the end of the Old Testament, you'll know that when they rebuilt the temple, after they were carried off into Babylon, they came back, they had an opportunity to rebuild the temple that Solomon had originally built and that had been destroyed for 70 years. It was so pathetic by comparison to what had been there that all the old men who remembered the old temple wept out loud at how pathetic their temple was. Well, they finished that job and that sort of sad looking temple remained in Jerusalem for hundreds of years until Herod came along. And Herod came along and he led some masterful construction programs. And the Temple Mound was greatly increased and the Temple Complex was greatly uh, expanded and it became one of the wonders of the world. And people would come from all over just to see this great temple that Herod had built and became known as Herod's Temple. And that's the temple that Jesus and the apostles moved around in, in Jerusalem. He also built this incredible fortress city in the southern desert called Masada, which is built way up high on this cliff. It's almost impossible to think that they could actually build that up there, but we've been there and it's really, really awesome. And you think, wow, this is a guy 
he built back with dressed stones. I mean, this was impressive stuff. There's still walls that he built that are still standing 2,000 years later. But at what cost? At what cost did they get things rebuilt with dressed stones? They had to accept Herod, who was an Edomite, to reign over them and corrupt them. He corrupted the priests in Jerusalem so that they became politically entangled with Herod's family. He even ordered the massacre of all of the babies in Bethlehem to try to cover up the birth of the Messiah. And all the chief priests and all the leaders in Jerusalem just had to look the other way. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, we know he does things that he shouldn't do. We know he's kind of a murderous psychopath. But, you know, he's brought such great benefits to our nation. Look at what he's done for us. Pride caused them to think that they were entitled to have something great. And when pride begins to speak to us in our head and in our hearts to make us think that we are entitled to something great, something better than we have, we're not thankful for what we've been given, we're not humble and grateful, but we're arrogant and proud and we're grasping and be careful because when that happens, we will begin to compromise with the world we will begin to do things that we know are wrong. We will begin to cut corners. We will begin to violate our conscience. We will begin to do whatever we think we need to do to make happen what we think should happen. And this is subtle. Sometimes I think we read things in the Bible and we don't really believe them. I'm going to read you a passage that I think we read in the Bible and we don't really believe it. It's in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. James says this, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Do we believe that? Someone says, hey, I, I got a great business idea. We're going to go here and we're going to set up this thing and we're going to make this much money and look and run all the profit projections and we're going to do all this and you're on board. We think, oh yeah, sounds like a great plan. Let's get on board. Do we ever stop and think, that's evil. Because there's an arrogant presumption that says, I can control and predict the future. Yesterday, we were listening to um, this podcast called American History Tellers, and they were doing a series on the gold rush, the California gold rush. And it's amazing how many professing Christian people with Bibles in hand did such horribly wicked things because they had convinced themselves, all we need to do is go out to California and stake our claim and dig a little bit and we'll do this, that, and the other, and then we'll be rich. And because they thought they were entitled to that, because they set their hearts and minds on it, they went down a path and they, and they compromised and compromised and compromised and compromised. The Lord says, boasting with self-confidence is evil. And he calls us to live in humility rather than in such evil pride. What is the worst sin? Pride. What is the root sin? Pride. I think sometimes in our culture we think, oh, maybe it's lust, or maybe it's violence, or maybe it's... Yes, all those things are bad, but almost always they come from a root of pride of putting ourselves in the middle of the story of our lives instead of God. Instead of remembering it's his story and we're privileged to have any part to play in it whatsoever, we think it's my story and I'll find a place for God. A couple hours on Sunday morning, a couple minutes in the morning. But then it's my story. 
That's pride. And for all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Verse 2 of this song, the Lord tells us who his anger is stretched out against. The people, verse 13, did not turn to him who struck them, nor inquire of the Lord of hosts. So the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed in one day. The elder and honored man is the head, and the people who teach lies, the prophet who teaches lies, is the tail. For those who guide this people have been leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are swallowed up. Therefore the Lord does not rejoice over their young men, and has no compassion on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. The Lord is angry with all levels of society in Israel. Listen, our culture, media within our culture, has figured out that one of the best ways to build an audience and get clicks, get eyeballs watching, is scapegoating, blame shifting. We're in a terrible state, and whose fault is it? It's those people over there. And it's those people over there. They're so bad, they're not like us, we're the good guys. It's their fault. And that's, turn on any cable news channel, and you will hear them saying that. It works. It works because it appeals to our pride. And it gets us to think that the problems in the world are with other people. I love G.K. Chesterton, who was a British writer, early part of the 20th century, was influential in the life and thinking of C.S. Lewis, among others. But apparently the, the London Times did uh, a sort of an invitation to great writers to write guest columns in the Times as to what is wrong with the world. They wanted all these different voices to, to proclaim on the pages of the Times, what is wrong with the world? I mean, that sounds like that, it's just going to get it, right? And G.K. Chesterton writes in, Dear Times, with regard to your inquiry as to what is wrong with the world, I am, yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> Philosopher Joseph de Mestre is famous for saying, Every nation gets the government it deserves. And there's some real truth to that statement. Isaiah pictures the leaders of Israel, the elder and the honored man, as the head of the nation, and then the prophet who teaches lies as the tail. But what is the body? What is the heartbeat? What is the musculature? What is making it move? It's the people. And it's all the people. The leaders lead in a corrupt way because the body follows them that way. And the prophets who are supposed to speak truth in the name of the Lord, they're lying because they're being led by the people and telling the people what they want to hear. So everyone is guilty from head to tail. 2 Timothy 4.3, Paul warns, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. It is terrible that we have in this world teachers who abound, who are willing to tell people what they want to hear, who will gladly manipulate the word of God to appease the passions of the masses. That is terrible, and it frustrates me whenever I see it. Someone I know is just selling people something because people are willing to buy it. It's terrible that those teachers exist. But it's also terrible that they have an audience who wants to hear that. We can all be tempted to only listen to people who agree with us, who tell us that we're right and that we're good and that the problems in the world and in our lives are caused by other people. They stroke our ego, they make us feel better about ourselves, but the other thing it does is it deafens us 
to the voice of God's word. If we only listen to those who agree with us, we are really just listening to ourselves. And if we do so in the name of God, then we're taking the word of God and twisting it so that it's really our word. And that is evil. And for all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. We get to verse 3 of the song, and the Lord turns his attention against the self-destructive wickedness of his people. Isaiah 9, 18 to 21. For wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. They slice meat on the right, but are still hungry, and they devour on the left, but are not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim. Ephraim devours Manasseh. Together they are against Judah. For all this, his anger has not turned away. His hand is stretched out still. God declares here that wickedness burns like a fire. This is the, the great lie that Satan and our flesh conspired together to tell us is that sin is more fun than righteousness. Oh yes, it's wrong. Oh yes, we all know you shouldn't do that. Oh yes, we know it's not right. But come on, it'll be so much more fun. But it's fire. It's fire that brings destruction. Think about David. We're in during the week, during the day, we're in 1 Samuel. We're coming to the end of 1 Samuel, and toward the end of 1 Samuel is one of the darkest chapters in David's life. It's a period of time when he actually goes to live among the Philistines and puts himself under Achish, king of Gath, and as his servant, as his bodyguard. It's a terrible time, but, but how does he get there? Well, he gets there first because he's fleeing from Saul, and the first time he's fleeing from Saul, he's in a panic, and he's not trusting in the Lord, and he's looking instead at his external earthly circumstances, and he thinks, I've got to get away out of here. And so he goes to Achish to present himself to him. But when he gets there, he realizes, what am I doing? This is, this is terrible. And so he fakes like he's insane. And it's one of the comical story, but he's like, you know, faking like he's insane and letting the drool run down on his beard. And, and Achish finally says, what? come on, guys, I've got enough madmen here. I don't need this one. Send him away. And David escapes, and he actually writes Psalm 34 out of that, which is one of my favorite psalms. Uh, and so, great, right? Until he has another encounter with Saul and the army of Israel, and he becomes convinced again that there's no hope for him, that he's going to be killed by Saul. And so he flees again to Achish. Only this time, he stays. You see, the first time we might mess around with a sin, but then come to our senses and realize, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. That's not a good idea. But then the second time we're drawn, we stay a little bit longer. It's the old saying that sin will always take you farther than you wanted to go and keep you longer than you wanted to stay and cost you more than you wanted to pay. And that's why God warns us against it, because he loves us. But we are foolish. In Romans 1, God is making his case through the Apostle Paul of why it is that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And the end of Romans 1 wraps up this case by saying this, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, 
ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And we could easily say, boy, that's such an accurate picture of our culture. But the truth is, that's an accurate picture of humanity. Because that's what people are like. We don't want to acknowledge God. And so we push God out of our thinking. And as soon as we push God out of our thinking, we fall into one or more of these traps. And when we're falling into one or more of these traps, we know we're doing wrong. But to make ourselves feel better, we pretend that we're justified in it and we encourage others who do it along with us. That's the world. And that's where we would be by nature. Right? Ephesians 2 says, you, believer, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, carrying out the desires of our flesh and our mind. That was us. Only the grace of God brings us out of that. And because of that, because of this desire to do things that hurt us and hurt others unrepentantly, his anger is not turned away and his arm is stretched out still. Our last verse brings us into chapter 10. And it says, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this, his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Corrupt and wicked rules and rulers. When we have different rules and different systems available to the rich who can afford the lawyers and who know how to manipulate the system, or when we put into law as that which we declare to be right and good, which God declares to be sinful and destructive, this deserves the wrath of God and it provokes the wrath of God. And there's a warning here, and that is, when that judgment comes, you will have nowhere to hide. Jesus is coming again. He has promised us that he is coming again. And when Jesus comes again to judge the living and the dead, no amount of money will be able to bribe that judge no political connections will be able to manipulate the system of his perfect justice. He sees with pure and holy eyes, and he judges with perfect justice. No one will escape. If we hear what these four verses of this song are saying, they're saying to us this. Everyone who is proud and arrogant in heart. Everyone who leads people astray or who follows after people who lead people astray. Everyone who is selfish. Everyone who engages in self-destructive wickedness. Everyone who passes, participates, or supports unjust laws is subject to the wrath of God. And there is nothing you can do to appease him. And if we really hear that, what we really need to hear is that's me. I may do so in small, subtle ways that are socially respectable, and, but it's me. And God is angry with these things. He's angry with these things because they harm his creation and they mar his image in his people who should reflect his character but who instead reflect selfishness and foolishness. And so Psalm 7, 11, and 12 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. Whereas the refrain in here in Isaiah says over and over again, for all this his anger is not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. 
It's a heavy message. I hope that we all together feel the weight of that reality. Because that's the reality. God is holy. And God is just. And Jesus is coming again. But I hope we're all asking as well, well where's my hope then? If this is me, where is my hope? And I will tell you this quite simply. The only solution to the stretched out hand of God's anger is the stretched out hand of God's love. What can turn away the anger of God? Only the willing sacrifice of God himself, God the Son, who stretched out his hands and who took the anger of God on himself on the cross. He took the wrath that we deserved. In my place, condemned, he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Romans 5, 6 through 9 says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would be willing even to die. But God shows his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of the solution is not found in us. It's not found in any work we can do, any words we can say, any price we can pay, any promise we can attempt to keep. The answer is not found in us. The answer is found in the cross of Jesus Christ and the one who hung there in our place and the one who keeps every promise and the one who drank the cup of God's wrath to the bottom so that we could drink the cup of God's blessing instead. That's what we remember when we share in the Lord's Supper. We remember that it's his body that is our righteousness and our peace, and it's his blood that is our forgiveness. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So turn to the outstretched arms of the Savior today. He has paid the price for your sins with his blood. He's taken away the wrath of God that we deserve. And what he asks is that we trust him. And that we say, yes, Lord, I am yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such grace. We deserve your judgment. We know we're guilty. And yet we receive love forgiveness, acceptance, cleansing, adoption, inheritance, all because it was paid for by Jesus. So, Father, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, may we be oh so thankful and oh so hungry and thirsty for what Jesus alone brings us. We pray this in his name. Amen.